let's start with a quick historical recap of Florida. So the Civil War is over. The southern states have lost, and the southern states are under a brief period of Union occupation we commonly know as Reconstruction. During this period, uh, we're largely dominated by white northern Republicans. And there are some positions given to the newly freed African Americans who were formerly slaves. The executive branches were typically very powerful and very militaristic. The Reconstruction period was a very painful period for the South, and we were happy when it was over. When Florida was given back its autonomy and it was allowed to simply rejoin the Union as a state, just like the other Southern states were, we in Florida went further probably than any other state to try to make sure that we wouldn't have a very powerful executive again. So the way we set it up is that we have a panel style executive and for the longest time this was very unique to Florida. We would elect a governor but then we would elect six cabinet members who to an extent were subject to the governor but when it came to making executive decisions they would make them as a group, which means they could easily outnumber the governor and overturn his decision. So, who were these uh, panel executives? Well, we have the governor, and then we elected, of course, the attorney general. We elected the commissioner of agriculture. We elected the comptroller. We elected the uh, treasurer. We elected the secretary of education and the secretary of state. There we go, all six. Didn't even have to look at my notes. So we would elect those six members and they with the governor would make executive decisions. During this period, our state was largely dominated by Southern Democrats. Um, this was the solid South. So all the way up until shortly after the Lawton Childs administration, this was how it worked. Is it coincidence that this panel-style executive ends with the last Southern Democrat to be governor of Florida. Maybe. But shortly after Lawton Childs' administration, uh, we made a significant change to this panel-style executive. We voted for it in 1998, but it wouldn't go in effect until 2002. So, let me now go into what our new panel-style executive looks like. So, we've entered a new era of Southern politics. White Southerners, many of whom had been loyal Democrats most of their lives, they're now loyal Republicans, and to speak to many of them, you'd think they were never Democrats. If you've ever read 1984, uh, you may want to think back to that particular scene in that novel where they were at war with, I believe it was Eurasia, and in mid-sentence, the man announcing gets a little report that, oh, actually, we're at war with East Asia. And in mid-sentence, he changes to, oh, we're at war with East Asia. We've always been at war with East Asia, and Eurasia has always been our ally. And the people believe it without question. So, uh, Florida is Republican. White Southerners are Republican. We've always been Republican, and we've always watched Fox News. So Jeb Bush becomes governor. He actually ends up being a very popular governor. He promotes the school vouchers idea, which is widely popular in Florida, but it's run into a lot of constitutional problems. I've talked about that in other videos. He's the first Republican governor, and early into his administration, that change takes effect. We shrink the size of our cabinet, making Jeb Bush the most powerful governor probably since Reconstruction. So now instead of having six elected members, we have three. Two of them are the same. We elect the Commissioner of Agriculture, and we also elect the Attorney General. Yes, I just took a, t a little peek at my notes. But now, we elect a new position. It's called Chief Financial Officer. The Chief Financial Officer has taken on the role of Secretary of Treasury, but has also taken on the role of Comptroller, so we consolidated those two positions. The remaining two, that is Secretary of Education and Secretary of State, they are now appointed and they no longer get to vote an executive decision, so they simply answer to the governor. So we have those three members, and our governor is not all powerful. These three people could band together and overturn the governor, but that's only if they all band together. Otherwise, the governor controls the executive branch, and the executive branch is very powerful. When we made it as powerful as we did, we probably didn't consider that it would be dominated by a governor the way it has become. 
So let's talk about that now. How powerful is our governor since that change? With this change to three elected cabinet members, Florida has been reconstructed to have a far more powerful executive. I want you to also consider that we are one of the few states that gives our governor the authority to start making cuts without the approval of the legislature if those cuts are necessary to balance the budget. So that means that our governor actually is immensely powerful. If the legislature fails to balance the budget, the governor gets to make decisions almost unilaterally. Only if those three cabinet members band together against the governor can the governor be stopped. So that brings me to a very controversial decision by our current governor, Rick Scott. First, let me quickly remind you that the governor can make cuts without the approval of the legislature to balance the budget. And this was the situation that Rick Scott was faced with when he took office. He made many cuts. Uh, many of them were upsetting, but they were certainly within his constitutional authority. But one of those cuts may not have been. Rick Scott refused federal funds for a high-speed rail. Now, wait a minute. How do you balance the budget by refusing funds from the federal government? Does that make a lot of sense? Wouldn't federal funds actually help that situation? Well, Rick Scott's argument was that the federal funds ultimately would not cover the entire cost and we would have to pay for a lot of the cost of that high-speed rail ourselves. That may very well be true, but those federal funds would have certainly at least covered the first three or four years when we were constructing it and setting it up. So this raises this question. If we are faced with a budget deficit, does the governor have the authority to make cuts that won't go into effect for several years? I want you to consider that, and if you are one of my students, this will likely be the discussion board topic. Yes, the valley 